Welcome back to the Mixed Reality Masterclass. My name is Toge, and in this episode, we're going to start to look at what it takes to film professional quality mixed reality using Live. If you're new to Mixed Reality and haven't seen the previous episodes in the Mixed Reality Masterclass, I would recommend checking out episodes one and two first, as they lay the groundwork for this episode and what's to come. From here, I'm going to break down what a pro workflow looks like for Mixed Reality and how you might be able to apply some of these techniques to your own workflow. All of that and much more in episode three of the Mixed Reality Masterclass Filming. Before we get started with this episode, I just want to say a quick apology to my subscribers for the long delay since the last episode. I won't get into the reasons for that delay here, but I did release a channel update video not long ago where I talked about where I've been and what I've been doing, and also the future of this channel. If you're curious, you can check that out here. But for now, let's get on with the episode. Yeah. The typical workflow for creating mixed reality content with Liv relies entirely on Liv creating the composition for you. You would just launch the game in auto mode or perhaps one of the manual fake lighting modes and capture whatever the result is. And there's nothing wrong with that, especially if you're streaming or just doing simple YouTube content. But capturing only the live composition means you lose a lot of control when it comes to the edit. If you don't have the ability to control the virtual and real cameras separately in post, it's going to be an awful lot harder to produce anything of a professional standard. It will also be especially important to have this control if you're moving your camera while filming. Unless you have a massive green screen, you're likely to capture things with the real camera that you don't want in your MR composition. The solution to all of this is a function of Live called Dump Mode. This mode, which was recently made available to all Live users, will still create that standard Live composition you're used to, but will also separate out a few other layers that you can capture and use to rebuild as your own composition in post. You'll notice the Dump Mode output is split into four quadrants with the standard live composition in the bottom right. The bottom left is the virtual camera only, which you'll notice is missing the feed from the real world camera. This layer normally makes up the background of a composition, so we'll just call it the background layer. In the top left is the foreground layer. This contains the parts of the virtual camera that should be in the foreground or in front of the real world camera. Live determines where to split the foreground based on the position of the VR headset, so you'll notice parts of the virtual camera pop in and out of the foreground, depending on where the headset is in the space. Then finally, in the top right, we have an alpha key for the foreground. When we get to the edit, we'll be using this to determine how the foreground will be included in the composition, and if there's any transparency in the foreground. This alpha key layer might be confusing at first, but if you remember back in episode one, when we made a static mask for Liv, where the white areas of the mask are kept and the black areas are discarded, it's the same concept here, but the mask only applies to the foreground layer. But for this episode, we don't need to worry too much about how that works, as for now, we're just focused on how this applies to your filming workflow. We'll continue to break this down in episode four when we do a deep dive on editing live dump mode footage. It can be a lot to wrap your head around, so I just want to start introducing these concepts to you. Firstly with filming, and then we'll start down the rabbit hole of editing. And believe me, that rabbit hole goes deep. If you've been following this channel for a long time, you may have noticed that the further I went down that rabbit hole, the longer my videos were taking to create and the longer my upload interval became. With that in mind, I'd like to show two different ways you can use Live Dump Mode, a fast way and a slow way. The slow method is for full manual composition where you capture the real camera footage separately to capturing live dump mode and build the composition yourself entirely from scratch in post. The fast method will actually utilize the live composition in the bottom right of dump mode and has no requirement to separately capture your real camera footage. This does mean you lose some control of your real camera footage in post, but as long as you have a well configured camera profile in live like you normally would, you'll still benefit from dump mode. I actually think using my fast dump mode method can be faster than trying to use the basic auto mode in Live, and more reliable too. That, that might sound crazy, but you'll see what I mean here in a minute. Well, how do we start? Depends on what you're shooting with, whether you've built a camera rig like we did back in episode two, 
or you're just using a webcam because that can work too. At the very least, I would recommend having a lighthouse tracker mounted on your camera, as that will make moving the camera and maintaining your live calibration a lot easier. Even if you only move it occasionally, it just makes the process of setting up shots so much easier and faster. In a lighthouse only environment, you're likely to only calibrate live once at the start of the filming session and only recalibrate if you ever change lenses or focal lengths. With the tracker and dump mode, you can freely move the camera pretty much wherever you like, just like filming with a normal camera, as long as your subject is in front of the green screen, of course. Even if you're just using a tripod, capturing various angles, a tracker will massively speed up this process. In conjunction with my fast dump method, you will also never need to worry about making static masks while filming, as that is much faster solved in post. So I highly recommend having a tracker on your camera. The other important thing to consider with your setup before we start with dump mode is the monitor that you'll be outputting live to. Rather than the typical 1080p output you get from regular live, with dump mode, there are four quadrants of 1080p, which become a 4K image. So we'll be recording live in 4K here, which does require a 4K monitor to output live to. You may remember on the camera rig we built in episode two that I had a small seven inch monitor mounted to it. It was a Lilliput A7S, which is only a 1080p panel, but it is possible to force it to 4K60 in the Nvidia drivers. With that said, I have had some issues since filming that episode. I can no longer get that monitor to work at 4K60. It only claims to support up to 4K30, which I can still set it to, but maybe a couple years of 4K60 has killed it. So if you were duplicating that setup, which I know some of you have, maybe skip the A7S and go for something which has proper 4K60 support out of the box. If you are using a dedicated 4K monitor for the live dump mode output, the camera operator may have difficulty framing the shot with all four quadrants on the screen at once. While shooting, we're usually only interested in seeing the live composition in the bottom right of the image. So what I like to do is tape off this section of the monitor to give it some clear boundaries. I also like to add third lines to help with framing. To make this taping off process fast, I made an image which, if displayed full screen on your 4K monitor, will give you the boundaries of each quadrant with third lines. This is a bit of a janky solution, but it will make it much easier for the camera operator to properly frame the shot. If you'd like to do the same, I've left a link to this image in the description. Now, before we get to setting up live for dump mode, we'll need to make a few adjustments to our OBS setup. First, click on settings and go to video. We'll need to change both the base and output resolutions to 3840 by 2160. If it doesn't appear as an option in the dropdown, you can manually type 3840 by 2160 in both boxes. You'll also notice I have my frame rate set to 59.94 FPS rather than 60 FPS. If you are doing the slow method, which is full manual composition with your real camera footage recorded separately, it's important that you match the frame rate of the real and virtual cameras. Since 60 FPS on most cameras is actually 59.94 FPS, we need to match this in our recording of the live output. If the frame rates of both sources don't match, it will be really difficult to keep them in sync in post. Over time, it will start to look like having an incorrect latency setting in live. But if you're just doing the fast method, relying entirely on the live dump mode output, you can leave the OBS frame rate set to 60 FPS. On to live now and actually enabling dump mode, everything will still run through the usual PC VR capture tool, but there's a few tweaks we'll need to make. Firstly, in the output tab, we'll need to set the resolution to 3840 by 2160 at 60 FPS. Also confirm that you are outputting live to the correct monitor. Next, hop into your camera profile and if you are using any static mask or crop, it's time to disable those. With dump mode, it's not going to matter if you have unwanted stuff in your camera feed, as it will be quicker to remove that in post than it will be here in the camera profile. Then to the calibration tab, and if you do have a tracker on your camera, select it from the tracker dropdown. Otherwise, leave this as static. 
Then perform a calibration and set latency just like normal. Though, as we covered in episode one, the latency should be set while the game is running. So you may need to revisit this later. Save your camera profile and go to the capture tab. We're ready to launch the game now. And what I will typically do is launch the game from the dropdown in auto mode. Just note that the target res for the game should still be 1920 by 1080. Hit sync and launch and you should see the game start with live like normal. Now we'll hop over to the manual tab and in the target dropdown, select the game executable. Next, hit the effects dropdown and select dump plus composite. You should now see the live output change to the four quadrants of dump mode. Just remember to reselect the game window before you start playing and recording, otherwise you can see a drop in frame rate. If at any point you need to recalibrate while using dump mode, you might notice that it stays in dump mode while calibrating too. To get around this, you can change back to default compositing, but you may have more success if you just exit the game to recalibrate. Now there's one more important piece of hardware that we haven't discussed yet, and that is a slate or clapboard. Especially if you're doing the full dive manual composition, you'll be synchronizing two separate sources in post, and the slate will be essential for this. After hitting record in OBS and on your camera, give the slate a good clap in front of the camera and you'll be able to use that frame to line up the two sources later. Even if you're just doing my fast dump method without capturing your real camera separately, I still recommend the slate as it will help you identify each shot later. You can put whatever you like on the slate, but generally I'll use a shot number with a simple description of the shot, which is usually a camera angle or a particular camera movement, and any other important info for the shot, like the focal length I have the lens set to. And that brings me to my next point, which is the importance of planning out your project first. It's important to have a good idea of what the finished project will be, so you can break that down into a shot list that you can work to. If the project requires it, you might even go as far as sketching out a storyboard. But as long as you can arrive at a shot list that you can efficiently follow, your shoot will run much smoother. My shot lists for a gameplay video will generally contain detail like the direction a player is facing, whether that's at a particular angle or perhaps them facing the camera, whether it's a really wide shot or something tighter, and if there's any particular camera movement like a push in or a roll or pan. To help with this, there's a really great video on camera movement that I recommend from the channel Studio Binder. I'll leave a link to this video in the description. It goes into a lot of detail about the different types of camera movement. And though it's all aimed at traditional filmmaking, these concepts still apply to mixed reality and virtual production. With mixed reality, you can think of this as traditional filmmaking, but working with a virtual set, which is the game. And because that set is virtual, we can control it too. So to get a particular camera movement in our shot, not only can we move the camera, we can also move the set or play space. You'll see this being leveraged in a lot of my videos where the camera is moving simultaneously with the play space moving. This is a really useful technique for me as I'm operating out of home and not a massive soundstage. I don't have the space to perform some of these huge camera movements, but being able to move the play space as well as move the camera has really opened up the possibilities for big dynamic camera movement in my limited space. The types of play space movements that I'm doing are mostly just rotations, either gently swinging the play space side to side or constantly spinning through a full 360. Just note when using this technique that the player will have to move with the play space as it rotates. And if you're rotating it too quickly, you can make the player very dizzy and potentially motion sick. So proceed with caution. So how do we make these rotations happen? It depends on the title you're shooting with. The most user-friendly example of this would be in the game Autica. It has an option under spectator cam called mixed reality pan, which you can easily set up to swing or rotate the play space right there in the menu. There are less user-friendly examples of this built into both synth riders and boombox, where the play space movements are controlled through a script file. Though these scripts are more complicated, it's my preferred method as it opens up a lot more flexibility. 
You can do this in Beat Saber 2, but it's with a mod called B-Spin. This also uses script files, but it gives you an in-game UI to swap between them. You won't find this mod in Mod Assistant, but I'll leave a link to it in the description. Creating these scripts is not a well-documented process, so I might do a deep dive on that in a separate video later. There is a more universal approach to play-space rotation called Rotato Express. This is a tool originally created by Liv to be used in that first Oculus Quest Beat Saber trailer. It works by continuously updating the SteamVR Chaperone as a way of brute forcing rotation. It's quite performance heavy and is likely to give you frame rate issues. It also has issues working with mixed tracking environments, like if you're using the MetaQuest 2. So generally I say to avoid Rotato Express, but if you're brave enough and would like to try it, you can request access to it in the Live Discord. Just keep in mind that it's not an officially released tool and is not actively updated, so it may not always be available. So that about wraps up our episode on filming. In the next episode, we'll start to look at the post-production process for dump mode, both my fast dump method and the full dive manual composition. If you're watching this video at the time of release, episode four will be live one week from now. Otherwise, I'll leave a link to it up here. If you have any questions about anything I've covered here, you can leave them in the comments below or hit me up on Discord by following the link in the description. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Did I finish it? All right, I'm calling it. It's done.